Quote you verbatim, by the way, Lori. Yeah, I was listening. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. And then this is maybe I'm so glad to know that. What I do remember is you got up and walked out in the middle of my talk, and I thought I'd bore you to tears. <laughs> I don't remember that part, but I remember you and what I need to hear. Oh, Marilyn Stanton is leaving the building. I
We'll start in one moment. We're just trying to finalize uh, the technical issue we're having. Like bands, uh, the ability to provide a good maternity program is something of a hallmark of the rest of the system. I don't think it. I don't think it. I think this one. The others are. I think. Just, I'll double. But there are certain, certain things that when you get better at them, you don't like perforce you better at other things. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to be pretty good with infection control. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 I am in there. just want to double check on yours. It doesn't look like these mill two are either. Okay. Oh, it's so where's the house? In West Mount Airy in Philadelphia. Yeah. This is a big change for us. It's like the longest commute that I would could tolerate. And it's so easy to get to New York. Yeah. It takes like an hour and 10 minutes to get to New York. I go to New Brunswick. I'm a headquarter. So, but you can take a train if you want. Yeah. 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 I'm happy. The fact is, we've always had a little three bedroom house. Yeah, that would be great. Manageable. Okay. And, uh, to raise two kids sure. and it was cool. Well, I'm thinking that and, I uh, also. I like what we wanted to do. That I didn't put in my. You know, she wanted all of that. She never had it. Okay, okay. So now she wanted it. I don't want it, but. She does, and so I'm going to go along. Yeah, really, I'm going to go along with it. This one? You can? Okay. Okay. So hopefully, we'll be able to get you guys to come to the house. You know how it is with all this. Yeah, I always think. But this is an interesting house. You know who lives there? No. Clarence Gamble. James Clarence Kim. Yeah, I didn't see anything the on it, but everything must be under the craft to try to get it. Very interesting guy, University of Pennsylvania professor, did a lot of work with Spanish. He also was a great proponent of eugenics. Mozambique has seen remarkable growth since the end of the Civil War. Seven thousand participants. Illiterate blacks sterilized in South Carolina thanks to Dr. Gamble's clinics. We're left behind. All right, so my apologies for our delayed start. Um, as you may have noticed, we had a, a technical issue. For those of you sitting towards the back of the room, we're going to have printouts of the PowerPoint, so you won't miss you won't miss a thing. Just give us a, a few minutes for that. I also want to apologize because I am not Congresswoman Maloney, but she is coming. I promise you, um, she'll be here in the next hour or so. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to start today's event called Restoring Hope and Dignity, New Developments and Back best practices in addressing maternal morbidities. My name is Sandeep Patala, and I'm a senior program associate with the Maternal Health Initiative here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Today's event is brought to you as part of our Advancing Dialogue on Maternal Health series, where we work to identify challenges and dis discuss strategies for improving maternal health. The series is generously supported by UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, as well as historically by the Maternal Health Task Force. As many of you know, the Wilson Center aims to bring the worlds of policy, practice, and academia together. For the second year in a row, we have been voted the top think tank to watch in the U.S. and one of the world's best ten top 10 think tanks. Excuse me, there are a lot of T's and I mess that up every <laughs> time and you have witnessed that now. <laughs> um, so speaking of watching, I wanted to um, provide a note about today's event. Um, the folks who are tuning in to our live webcast who have been very patient while we were ironing out our issues um, will want to hear the discussion. So when we get to that portion, I'd ask for those of you in the room to use a microphone and my colleagues will be around with those. And I'd also ask you to introduce 
introduce yourself and affiliation. I wanted to mention, in case you can't see that far up yet, and again, the slides are going to be available, that the Twitter handles we are using today are MH, hashtag MHDialog, hashtag Fistula, hashtag NFistula, and hashtag Prolapse. Um, the Wi-Fi password is on the wall. If you uh, regularly come to our events, you, it is updated, so you might need to reload the username. Before I direct your attention to our esteemed speakers, I wanted to tell you a story, a quick story, because we are running behind. So the first time I went to Africa, it was February of 2005. And I thought that I understood disparity before I went. I understood, or I thought I understood, um, to some extent, my privilege. I uh, was a social worker in Camden, New Jersey at that point. And for those of you who are familiar with domestic issues as well, it doesn't get much rougher than Camden. It's one of the poorest and most dangerous cities in the United States. So I was a social worker there. I had grown up going back and forth to India almost every summer. So I thought I had a little bit of a clue. Well, I did. Um, I learned um, the first time I went like I said was February of 2005 and one of the, the opportunities I had um, I was in Mali was to visit two of the fistula hospitals there uh, I was busy clicking away focusing in on stories of the woman that you'll see um, in that 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 picture right there I was listening to what was happening in her life she was she had experienced a fistula one of the fortunate women um, who was getting treatment and I was hearing about her experience being ostracized in the community before that treatment. When I came back to the U.S. and I was creating the PowerPoints that we, um, that I now <laughs> work so hard with, with our speakers to make sure they have, I know all the work that goes into them, but as I was preparing the PowerPoint, I just happened to notice, and I didn't notice it when I was on the ground, but do you see what her IV is being held up with? It's a stick. So I was clueless. I thought I understood quality of health care. I thought I understood the impact of access to preventative care. And that was a stark reminder for me um, that, I, that I really didn't. And, and by all means, I'm not taking from the innovation of using a stick to hold up an IV, right? I don't want to take from that. I'm not trying to say they weren't working um, to restore her hope and her dignity. But it was, it, was, it was just something that made me committed to wanting to do this the rest of my life. So so I'm, I'm standing uh, in front of you feeling privileged almost over 10 years, I guess, later that, 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 we're, that I work for a forum where we talk about issues such as fistula, that we're here today to talk about how data and best, pra best practices are constantly being updated and it's important for all of us in this room. Um, and there's a lot of you, so thank you for coming, especially when we thought it might rain at any point, but it's important for us to continue to have these conversations. Um, we've made a lot of great strides as a community around a maternal morbidity, but it's time um, now to really hone in on um, mortalities a bit more too, um, so that we can end them in our lifetime, and that's really feasible, and we're gonna hear a bit about that with work around fistula. So I am now gonna direct your attention to our speakers. The first person we're gonna hear from is Mary Ellen Stanton. She's the Senior Health Maternal Health Advisor at the Bureau of Global Health at USAID. Uh, many of you know Mary Ellen, and um, we do have bios available, so I won't get into great detail, but I did notice an important detail that isn't listed in Mary Ellen's um, bio. She recently won the highest honor for an American midwife, the Hattie Hernschmeyer Award. So thank you for joining us, award winner. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here and see many of you whom I know, and I hope I get to, to know more of you. Um, what I wanted to do is, uh, because I know that we've got experts on, on fistula, and step back just a little bit to the whole problem of maternal mortality. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context uh, from, from one society, Egypt, then uh, take you into a, a study that USAID supported in Bangladesh, uh, and uh, then finally uh, some word on, on mental uh, disability. 
I do, before I get started, really want to thank the Wilson Center, the Maternal Health Task Force, and of course UNFPA, who've been so terrific in sponsoring this initiative and, and uh, leading this through the years. It, it has brought such prominence to maternal health to have it here at the Wilson Center. So we're very grateful for that. In the, in the area of context of maternal disabilities, I have to tell you that long ago I was very taken by a study that was done in Egypt aptly called the silent endurance, uh, which I, I think because of naming it that way really says a lot about the lives of women who experience reproductive morbidity. Uh, women are taught to uh, endure malaise and pain related to menstruation, pregnancy, and childbirth. Um, they often, usually we see, place personal needs, including even basic dietary intake after childcare and um, a a after their husband's needs, all subordinate to the other family's needs. Uh, the woman's heavy workload uh, plus her lower status doesn't allow uh, her to seek medical help in many instances. And she sought to, uh, is taught to serve others without complaints, without delay. Um, there's a real lack of awareness uh, of women uh, about their own health, about their own bodies. And few will discuss their problems, as I would say maybe in this society today, uh, because of issues of, of social stigma. Health professionals, and I hate to abuse great generalizations. I'm taking this from this report here. Um, rarely lend a listening ear. I hope that's not true. But it may way too often be true. Uh, health professionals may uh, show a lack of interest or concern. And of course, we know some respond with disrespect and abuse. And health professionals, by and large, may have a lack of understanding about women's lives, their ignorance uh, of the conditions in which they live, uh, and so they think of, of women as a clinical case, uh, lends them not to um, care so much. A number of big reviews have been done over the years, uh, a couple very good ones by the Institute of Medicine. I'm not even recalling this here in the PowerPoint slides. And one out of the United Kingdom, which was called by the uh, All Parliamentary Group on Population Development and Reproductive Health, where they called for evidence from all over the world. Uh, they found really very little data. Uh, but they came to conclude, uh, this is Baroness Tong, the, the hearings chair, uh, that millions of women have their lives ruined by childbirth every year. Some of them might be better off dead. Wow. USAID uh, endeavored, and this is, I'm going to make the heart of this about, to, to let you know about a set of studies that we uh, did in Bangladesh. It was um, organized by, uh, uh, and the uh, final journal, or a set of journal articles in the Journal of Population Health and Nutrition from ICDRB, it's led by Marge Kablinski with Corinne Ronsman, but really with a raft of wonderful Bangladeshi researchers uh, who, um, through a mixed methodology, retrospective and prospective, and a rich data set from MATLAB, which had decades of uh, data, um, they, they had this robust methodology, and they combined it with physical examination of a subset of women. Um, and they were able to examine uh, maternal morbidity and disability and the consequences of that disability. 
Now this shows a, a, I don't know how well you can see it, a, a conceptual framework. Mainly the top bar is maternal morbidity and it leads to consequences or disabilities. But then it looked at those consequences of the consequences on the child, uh, the family and the household and further consequences to women including psychological uh, consequences and survival. So we do have a little data on, on uh, survival as well. The, uh, there's a big section in the second paper that has many definitions about maternal morbidity and I know that this is getting a great deal of attention in a working group from uh, WHO that has embarked on a massive look at this. Um, but it includes both physical and, and mental illness uh, related to the pregnancy or childbirth. And in the area of acute morbidities, they're, they're subdivided into morbidities and then the severe. Uh, of which they may be termed acute maternal indications. I think that's an old term now, but it's still in the literature. Severe acute maternal morbidities, or SAMs, and what I think we more commonly uh, talk of as near miss, which relates to, to uh, organ, pro, uh, organ collapse, organ failure, and the survivors of those then may experience uh, postpartum morbidities at, or um, long-term chronic ones. Um, the detail is, is in the paper. I think first of all, uh, I call your attention to the summary conclusion. Um, previously, before this study, we, we said over and over again, uh, in numerous papers, 20 women with uh, complications uh, there are 20 complications for every uh, maternal death. And you will see that in their literature over and over again. What was found out in the Bangladesh study is that there was an underestimate and that there were 40 complications of both the severe um, and less severe variety um, for, for every death. So that when we do these extrapolations of millions of women, which I haven't done here because I hate to do that, it's uh, <laughs> um, it gives you lots of millions of numbers for uh, press releases, but I don't know that that really helps ultimately. But it did show that this was very significant. And I want to say that when this study was done in around 2008 to 2010, Bangladesh was bringing its maternal mortality way down. This is not the worst case scenario. Um, and within Bangladesh, one could argue, because of the use of uh, facility delivery, that the um, groups in Matlab and in Chanpur, where these studies were, uh, were of women who were somewhat better off uh, than uh, than Bangladesh as, whole, as a whole, and certainly than poorer areas of Bangladesh. The studies found that 10% of the women uh, have, women have complications in the in the interpartum period, and 40% uh, um, ha have complications both from the interpartum and those that show up in the postpartum period. So it's very significant. Now, most of these are relatively mild, we found. There was not a lot of uh, second and third degree prolapse. There was not a lot of fistula at all in these populations, which I think is somewhat surprising, but may go back to the fact of the country and the place in the country where the study, study was done. And for people interested in this rare bit of data on where death occurs in this particular place, 25% died at home. Um, I'm just going to pick out a few things from these studies, which are so rich. Uh, but in terms of the, the what we're calling the consequences of the consequences, the maternal complication, um, 
when there were chronic disabilities, such as a uterine prolapse, uh, women could experience something which they called kota, which is an insult. Uh, and it's ridicule by family uh, and in-laws. And I can see people nodding here because they know this, this well. Uh, a woman with stress incontinence said, if people find a deficiency, they will castigate me. During quarrels, they will take the upper hand and stigmatize me. No wonder women don't want to talk about their reproductive health problems. <laughs> the other is physical and sexual violence for not meeting husband's demands. The husband of a woman with second-degree prolapse uh, was reported as saying, if I cannot sleep with you, what is the use of keeping you? I'll divorce you. Now, we looked in, in the area of consequences of consequences, we wanted to look into the economic consequences for the household. And here, I must say, uh, th there was some good news here. Um, that people reported needing to take out loans, uh, in some cases to sell assets. But usually over the course of the year, they were able to regain their economic stability in that area in Bangladesh. Even among the poorest households in Bangladesh, there's an unexpected resiliency, resiliency to the economic shock of paying the cost for obstetric emergencies. We did find a vast array of quality of life issues. And I want to bring to your attention something that almost gets lost. And it comes into the area of maternal disability, but the result is what happens as a result of a perinatal loss, a stillbirth or a early newborn death. Uh, women in, in this area in the qualitative work reported that a woman could be sequestered for years and unable to carry out her religious rituals that they consider fundamental to their spiritual well-being. Uh, so this really brings about not only social isolation, but a, 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 a spiritual challenge as well for them. They did re report postpartum depression and emotional violence by the family. Uh, there's something else I want to bring to your attention because it's not m morbidity, but it came out of this this very well done study, and it was reported separately by Corinne Ronsman, the effect of a parent's death on child survival, that we so often look for data. This is data you can use, a, a conclusion. The cumulative probability of survival to age 10 years was 24% in children whose mother died before their 10th birthday, compared to 89 uh, uh, whose mothers died before their 10th birthday compared to 89% in those whose mothers remained alive. Finally, uh, infant morbidity is eight times higher for those infants who died if the um, uh, mother survived. Last, I want to bring to your attention, and I'm not going to do this in any depth at all, it is one slide that I want to bring to your attention, a wonderful seminar in this maternal uh, initiative at Woodrow Wilson Center uh, on mental disability and maternal health. Uh, Jean Hiles from Monash University came here and gave a fabulous presentation. It's on the website. And she did an extensive review in low and middle income countries and found that anxiety and postpartum depression were common in uh, pregnancy, actually depression, both in pregnancy and the postnatal period, that these problems are prevalent, few have access uh, to care, and that infants of mothers with common mental disorders are at a risk for poor growth, health, and development. How little attention we are paying to this. I will say that this room, I sure, is filled for Representative Maloney. It's filled because of the fabulous uh, advocacy work that's been done by UNFPA and in gender health and many others, the Worldwide Fistula Fund on Fistula. Who are the advocates for mental health? Um, 
th there, it is so meaningful and so important. So finally, I'm going to finish with uh, the, the call to action that we developed after the Bangladesh study, but I think it fits for all. And first and foremost, postpartum care, see the women, assess the issues. Are they, they leaking? Are they depressed? Do they need family planning? Uh, what are their issues? Are they infected? Are they bleeding? Uh, postpartum care has been so, so, so neglected. Secondly, we need to develop the ability to respond. Uh, some of this is bread and butter care. And some of it is things that organizations and individuals are not used to dealing with, whether it's uh, repairing a fistula or um, working with a woman who is anxious or has major depression. Uh, thirdly, social protection. Uh, although we found in that area in Bangladesh so, uh, economic resiliency, we know that is not true everywhere. And uh, attention, particularly in these high burden countries, uh, but also maybe in low burden countries and cities like Camden, New Jersey, uh, social protection is very, very important in the postpartum period. And finally, going back to that amazing Egyptian study done in the early 90s that described the context for women to spotlight the fundamental issues of, of status and human rights for women. So thank you so much, uh, and I look forward to hearing the other presentations. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I really appreciated how you ended with that, that call to action. I, I thought I'd taken um, so many, so many asterisks next to quite a few things you said. The quote around, they might be better off dead. Um, the underestimate, but, but ending on that note um, was particularly powerful. And I, I certainly do appreciate you referencing previous seminars as well. She was referring to a session where we had um, Jane Fisher um, join us from Australia. And she did talk about postpartum de depression and impacts, as we heard. And for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, we do have our live webcast, but we also have archive videos online. So you can um, easily tune into that. There's also an event summary if you don't have two hours to spare um, that highlights um, what was discussed at the time as well as the PowerPoints on the website. So that will be available for this session as well. So now let's change gears a little bit here about uh, UNS PA's work around ending fistula, um, how their campaign about their campaign's vision, priorities, successes, and events, and we're going to hear that from Erin Anasta Anastasi. She's the interim coordinator of the campaign to end fistula. She's a technical specialist on obstetric fistula with UNFPA, and we're going to actually start with a quick little video. Um, and again, I hope that you are able to see that okay from the back but the PowerPoints will be available. From United Nations Television, this is UN in Action. Mozambique has seen remarkable growth since the end of its 20-year civil war, but not all its citizens are participating in the country's new opportunities. 15-year-old Ilse Gwambe is one of those who are left behind. I met that boy and I got pregnant. Ilsa, then just 13 years old, was unable to continue school, and her life was about to change irrevocably. After my baby was born, my parents sent me to live at my boyfriend's parents' place. I was insulted by his parents. I wasn't welcome at all. In Mozambique, more than half of all young girls are married before the age of 18, one of the highest rates of child marriage in the world. Most are expected to become mothers soon after. The UN Population Fund, UNFPA's regional director, Bettina Moss. The potential development of the girl is interrupted 
And the girls have less opportunities for education, they have less opportunities for economic integration and uh, employment, they have less opportunities uh, to have uh, integration in the community as, uh, as a young woman. In Mozambique's remote areas, many women and adolescent girls deliver their babies at home with no access to medical care. When there are complications, they risk developing a devastating injury called obstetric fistula, which occurs during prolonged labor without medical attention. Those affected are left with chronic incontinence, and in most cases, a stillborn baby. 16-year-old Asicha Malanga was just 14 when she got pregnant. With her young husband away working in South Africa and the nearest clinic two hours away, she had no choice but to give birth alone. But there were complications and no medical care on hand to help. After the delivery, my baby was very weak and died. I called for help. I was very upset and I realized that I couldn't walk. Asita had developed a fistula. Over 2,000 new cases are reported annually in Mozambique. These child marriages are a big problem because the girls are just not prepared for pregnancy. Not only are their bodies not ready, but they are also not able to make the best choice for the baby. Dr. Michake Martin Tembe has recently been trained in fistula repair as part of the UNFPA coordinated campaign to end fistula. In the first three months of 2013, Dr. Tembe had already treated almost 20 fistula patients, many of them, like Asita, still in their teens. But many women affected by fistula never receive medical attention and can be ostracized by their communities and even their own families. Well, UNFPA supported the Ministry of Health to develop a national uh, fistula strategy, laying out how to prevent fistula, but it also works on how to reintegrate um, um, the girls into society once they're operated. If I get better, I hope I can have children one day. I'd come to the clinic so that I could have assistance and deliver my baby in better conditions. That's what I hope for. And she may get her wish. After successful surgery, many women can resume a full life and bear children. Yet child marriage continues to impact young women's lives across Mozambique. UNFPA is helping challenge these practices in the hope that all women and girls may soon gain full access to health, education, development, and finally to equality. All I want is to go back to school. I don't want to return to my husband. I suffered a lot and what I went through there was way too much. After school I will be able to have profession and move on my own. This report was produced by Guy Hubbard for Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. And I would like to thank especially the organizers today, Sandeep and her team, as well as my colleague, Sarah Craven, from the UNFPA Washington, D.C. office. Um, I always like to start the presentation with a personal story from a Fischler survivor, in person, if possible, or if not possible, with the video, um, as we did today, because I feel that Hearing the voices of those fishless survivors, hearing their stories in their own voices, is far more powerful than anything I could stand up here and say. That said, if you'll bear with me, I would like to speak for just a few minutes on behalf of UNFPA and the Global Campaign to End Fistula to give you kind of an overview of the campaign, some of our recent achievements, our vision, and what we hope to achieve going forward. So the vision of the campaign, we really strongly believe that fistula should no longer exist in today's world. We find that it's not only a public health problem, but it's really an issue of human rights, as Mary Ellen pointed out. And it's really a moral and ethical issue of our time as well. So we would like to see from today forward, no new cases of fistula. 
We know that fistula is preventable in almost every case. We know that it affects almost invariably the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable and marginalized girls in society, and therefore it's simply unacceptable. So no new cases is our vision. In addition, we believe that those women and girls who were unfortunate enough to develop fistula in the first place have a right, again, as a matter of human rights, as a matter of dignity, they have a right to be treated and to access surgical care to hopefully repair their fistula. In addition, part of the vision is that while treatment is necessary, it's not sufficient. So once that woman or girl gets her surgery and gets treated, we don't want her to just go home and disappear. Nobody knows what happens to her. Nobody knows whether she lives or dies, what becomes of her other children, what becomes of her families. So here's where the component of social reintegration services and follow-up comes in. And finally, another key piece of the vision is that for those perhaps most unfortunate women and girls, who've essentially been told, sorry, there's nothing we can do to help you. Those that we call deemed inoperable or incurable, we want to make sure that they are not forgotten and left behind, and that they have all of the support, all of the services they need for as long as they need them, until one day, hopefully, there will be a cure for them. So just to give you a snapshot of the global campaign to end fistula, we are present in over 50 countries around the world. As you can see from the map, it's primarily Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, countries where maternal mortality is still high and they're struggling to eliminate fistula. The campaign is led by UNFPA, but it's really a global coalition of over 90 partners at the international level, including all of my distinguished colleagues on the panel today. In addition, we have hundreds more partners at national and local levels. And since the campaign was launched in 2003, UNFPA has supported over 57,000 surgical repairs to help women and girls heal from fistula. And in addition to those 57,000 repairs, many campaign partners, including in Gender Health, Fistula Care Plus, the Fischler Foundation, with support from Johnson & Johnson and others, have supported thousands more surgical repairs. So the campaign operates on the basis of three key strategies, or what we refer to as the three pillars. The first being prevention, and we always say prevention is the best medicine, going back to this idea that really no woman or girl should ever get fistula in the first place. And when we speak of prevention, we speak of the whole range of broader maternal and newborn health care. So including, for example, midwifery, skilled attendance at birth, emergency obstetric and newborn care, including that vital cesarean section that can save a life and also prevent fistula as well as the family planning and sexual reproductive health services. And in addition to the campaign to end fistula that UNFPA is leading, we also have large global programs on each of these other components of prevention. The second key component, as we talked about, is treatment, typically surgery to help repair the fistula. And the third key component, again, is the social reintegration and follow-up, so that those women, once they've had their repair, they get the support, they get the services they need. Um, and I was really pleased to hear Mary Ellen use the term social protection. I think that's a key idea here. We talk a lot about how do we break that cycle of vulnerability, poverty, marginalization that renders those women susceptible in the first place. Just to say a bit more on the prevention side in terms of midwives, um, as I mentioned, UNFPA also runs a large global program on midwifery. And we're really working closely with midwifery schools and associations and governments around the world to strengthen the role of midwives in preventing fistula, as well as managing early management of cases of fistula, and as well as treatment, particularly referring women for treatment. So midwives play a key role. 
And in addition to the three pillars or the three strategies I talked about, another key area of work for the global campaign is advocacy. And we do advocacy at global, regional, and national levels. One of our key advocacy events every year is the International Day to End Obstetric Fistula, which was established in 2013. It takes place on May 23rd every year. This year, we held a side event at the World Health Assembly in Geneva. Um, and for me, one of the really exciting things that came out of this year's International Day is the United Nations Secretary General, every year on the day, issues a statement on ending fistula. And this year, he used the language of ending fistula in our lifetime. So we feel that that's a breakthrough, that we know that the global community is talking about ending preventable maternal and newborn deaths, ending preventable mortality, which is key. But we also really want to hear people talking, planning, and acting for ending fistula and other severe morbidities in our lifetime. Um, just to highlight another, I think, interesting and exciting piece of the campaign's work, and again, this is UNFPA, but also a number of our partners who are here and many who couldn't be here today, is the use of mobile technologies, mobile phones and other technologies to help empower women and girls who are living with fistula or recovering from fistula. There are a number of interesting, exciting initiatives out there. Um, I think we can talk more during the discussion if folks are interested. I've just highlighted a few key um, programs here as well as a film that we launched last year on the International Day to End Obstetric Fistula that highlights some of those initiatives, which are helping women and girls to connect to treatment, to connect to care, and also helping them to be followed up um, once they go back home so that we know they survive, they're healthy, and they're well. So um, another initiative that we're very excited about um, launched in recent years is the UNFPA fistula kits, fistula repair kits. And the idea essentially was to help improve the quality of care of fistula treatment, as well as to make life easier, to make the work easier for those people we consider heroes, those fistula surgeons who are actually out there in all corners of the world, sometimes in the toughest environments you can imagine, to help make their work easier so that when they need to do fistula surgery, they have right at their disposal all of the supplies and equipment they would need. And UNFPA worked closely with um, the International Society of Obstetric Fistula Surgeons, ISOFs, and some of the leading fistula surgeons in the world with decades of experience to listen to them and say, you know, what do you need? What needle, what suture, what, so that the kits would meet their needs. And I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge Johnson & Johnson. We have Conrad Person on the panel um, who generously donated high quality surgical sutures to the kits. Um, about a $2 million donation. And we're very grateful for that because it improves the quality of the kits, increases access, and also helps bring down the price of the kits. Those kits can be ordered online, as you can see on the website there. So another key initiative, a key project that the Global Campaign to End Fistula works on is the United Nations Secretary General's report on supporting efforts to end obstetric fistula. This report is issued every two years. So it came out last year. It will come out again next year. And it highlights progress over the last two years on ending fistula. It features achievements not only by UNFPA and UN agencies, but again, many of the partners, I think probably all of the partners on this panel today are mentioned in that report as well. Um, that report is available online at the website, as you can see. And I just wanted to highlight a few key findings from the most recent report, last year's report. So the report stated that, yes, we've made progress. In many ways, we've come a long way. And at the same time, we still have a long way to go. We really need to do more to prevent fistula and to treat all of those women and girls who are in need of treatment. We need more funding, we need more human resources, midwives, skilled birth attendants, fistula surgeons. We need to strengthen health systems as well as ensuring universal access 
so that every woman or girl has the care that she needs when she's giving birth. Antenatal care, skilled birth attendants, no matter how poor, no matter how remote, where she is, if she's in a conflict zone, humanitarian setting, every woman and girl gets that care that she needs. Another key focus of the report was national leadership. So really supporting countries to be in the driver's seat. Those countries who are still struggling to end fistula, that they would put in place national strategies for ending fistula, again, in our lifetime. And the report also highlighted the need to address the root causes of fistula, the underlying drivers of fistula. So again, the poverty, the inequalities, the vulnerability, um, and UNFPA also has big programs working on adolescent girls, the most marginalized, working on child marriage, some of those um, key determinants. And I know other partners in the campaign have such programs to address those as well. And finally, one key issue from the report that I wanted to draw your attention to is the call to make fistula a nationally notifiable condition. And this essentially would involve governments establishing registers so that they could identify in their country each and every woman who's living with fistula, follow her up to ensure that she is linked to the treatment and care that she needs, and follow her up over time, again with the aim of ensuring her health and well-being and that of her children and family. Um, when we speak of this national notifiable condition. I think in discussions I've had with colleagues, the best rationale I can think of for this initiative, why did we propose this, is an anecdote that I heard last year in Uganda at our International Obstetric Fistula Working Group meeting. And it came from a colleague working with CCBRT Hospital in Tanzania. She told the story of a young woman who came to CCBRT Hospital for fistula treatment many years after she actually developed the fistula. So the surgeon asked her, why did you wait so long? You know, if you knew the hospital was here, if you knew the treatment was there, the treatment's free, you don't have to pay anything. And her response was, eight years later, why she waited eight years, she was trying to save up the bus fare. If you can imagine suffering from a condition that's essentially ruining your life, and for eight years, you can't seek treatment because you can't afford to get there. And we know that there are stories of women who've waited 10, 20 years. We know, in fact, that most women living with fistula will die without ever receiving treatment at the current rate of progress. So this is the rationale behind the nationally notifiable condition. So um, just a couple more slides. I wanted to highlight some of the priorities of the global campaign this year and beyond. So we talked about supporting governments to scale up their capacity for preventing and treating fistula and also um, helping to reintegrate the fistula survivors. So we want not just in certain pockets of countries that women and girls get treatment, but anywhere and everywhere where there's a fistula survivor, that governments would have the capacity to help them. We also talked about national strategies and not only national strategies, but action plans that are budgeted and that have a timeline attached to go with them. So again, the idea of in our lifetime, really making it concrete and practical. We also support governments to develop national task forces for fistula so that they're in the lead, they're coordinating with all partners in country to develop and implement that strategy for ending fistula. Um, advocacy, as I mentioned, is a big area of work for us at various levels, global, regional, national. Um, in addition to the International Day to End Obstetric Fistula, we have a number of advocacy events we're working on. Just one that I'll mention briefly is, you may know that currently the UN Secretary General's strategy for every woman, every child is being updated. Um, colleagues are working on version 2.0. So we are working hard to integrate fistula and broader maternal morbidities as well into that global strategy. And finally, just a brief word on data. Um, I think Mary Ellen alluded to the fact that the numbers have always been kind of a challenge for us. We've struggled with the numbers. How many women and girls are actually out there living with fistula? Where are they? How do we reach them? So we are hoping 
in the near future to have some new numbers, um, new global estimates on fistula. That's one of our big projects for this year and next year. And finally, I'll end with highlighting some of the challenges we face and also inviting you all to help us overcome those challenges and to defeat fistula once and for all. So the question of political will, we feel that, again, at all levels, global, regional, and national, there needs to be a much stronger stance, the international community and nations saying, enough is enough. It's time to really put an end to fistula. We know we can do it, so let's get it done. Um, of course, we struggle with financial resources, the human resources, the backlog of cases. The UN estimates over 2 million women, you may hear various estimates, who are living and suffering from fistula. And I always say, even if it's one woman or 100 women or 1,000 women, that's one or 100 or 1,000 too many. And again, if we think of the fact that if things keep going as they are with the status quo, most of those women will die without ever having treatment. That's a huge challenge we face. And finally, again, the idea of the social reintegration, breaking that cycle of poverty and vulnerability, making sure no one is left behind. There's a lot of talk these days as the Millennium Development Goals draw to a close and the world plans the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals about leaving no one behind. So we really want to make sure that fistula, women and girls suffering from fistula and other maternal morbidities and disabilities are not left behind and fistula doesn't become neglected again. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. I, I knew that we were going to be talking about data and the need to focus on data, but uh, one of the things that I was really excited to hear was data. You talked about 57,000 women um, receiving care and, and, and adi additional women um, as well um, through partners and that's that's a really great data point. Um, you know, we, we've been seeing images and, and stories just multiply that by 57,000. That, that's huge. Uh, that's significant. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have bios available. Well, one thing that is not in Conrad's bio is one of the first events I ever moderated here at the Wilson Center in 2011 featured Conrad talking about other aspects of J and J's um, Johnson and Johnson's um, corporate contribution. So I kind of feel like, you know, in addition to to talking full circle about. Um, uh, Fischler today have also come kind of full circle in, in terms of speakers and we've we featured Lori before on a panel as well. So Conrad is the Director of Cor Corporate Contributions at uh, Johnson & Johnson. He's going to talk um, some more about their work around Fischler and he's also going to highlight a Fischler map uh, recently, or at least Fischler map. Well, this is a very daunting afternoon for me because I sit at a table surrounded by people who know so much more about this topic than I do that I can feel I must limit myself very narrowly to a few little things that are largely based on experience. And a few observations that I hope uh, will show the, that, are, that, are, that come from the perspective of a private sector donor. And maybe that's useful to consider as we proceed and talk and think about this. And because time is short, I'm going to zip through a few things. But I did want to just let you know that Johnson & Johnson, when it comes to its philanthropic giving, we do this out of our corporate, our credo, which is really the document that we feel guides and describes a successful corporation. And it says, part of what it says is that we should support good works and charities in the communities where we live and work and in the world community as well. And so in the interest of doing that, we've decided three areas should be where we focus. And the first of them, and the one where we put the most energy, frankly, is around saving and improving the lives of women and children. But uh, when it comes to obstetric fistula, because of who we are, we, we tried to take a look at the, at the totality of this issue. And we decided that uh, there are so many elements of it. And I think the speakers already have talked about them so well, there's no need in my rehashing that. But because we have this strong heritage of um, 
within the world of surgery. In fact, the first products Johnson & Johnson made were surgical supplies. We feel that we should focus on surgery and treatment. That should be the heart of where we put our energy. And we make surgical sutures so the products that we make can be leveraged against that goal. So we, we do see a point in being involved in, uh, in maternal care, but we treat that as separate from, fist, from, fist, from obstetric fistula. And we do see the, the, the importance of social reintegration and supportive services for women who through, uh, 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 who even though they're treated cannot be fully cured, that uh, they did, they, that, that kind of work to support them for, the life, for a lifetime, frankly, is also important, but we only do those things as a supporter of surgical programs. Okay. Well, Sandeep, you, you were kind enough to bring up the global fistula map, and this is something that we think is just great because it is data, and it's data that's coming from the field, and it really has, over a long, over a period of, uh, of years, begun to flesh out beautifully, and, we, and if you visit this, uh, this site, you can see that uh, there are now 267 facilities reporting on their activities with regard to fistula surgery. And this is fabulous because it gives us some idea of what we have to work with. So it's a resource uh, driven approach, I think. Um, and we, and when it comes to the, the donation of surgical sutures, we, we really do feel that this is an important way for us to support this because we have something that's unique to us and it's, it really says who we are. And we know that supply insecurity is a really major impediment to, to surgical programs. If you can't get the products that you need or if you're working with things that are not really appropriate for the job you're trying to do, you can't be terribly successful. And, and there, by one estimate, the amount that we are committing to give will supply 80% of the global need for, for sutures for, for fistula surgery for the next several years. And, we, uh, we're, and we're really grateful that UNFPA and Direct Relief are the two partners who are distributing these sutures. And I want to say something about this that, that points to a challenge. Uh, one of the things that we've learned over the years is that things that are given, that does not necessarily mean that they're going to be integrated and utilized effectively. This is why companies have marketing and sales divisions. This is why sometimes the things that you think are not terribly important are vastly successful because they are well presented to the public and they're conveniently available. So we really believe that even though we've donated these sutures, some additional energy is going to be necessary to get them out to the, to the programs themselves. And that's an important thing that, we're, that we are ruminating on right now at Johnson & Johnson. And we'll be counting on our partners, Direct, uh, Direct Relief and UNFPA, to give us ideas on how we can support them in this. Uh, one of the things that we also think is really important is the idea of making more surgeries available. And frankly, the, a, a competent surgeon seems to be at the heart of that. So FIGO has been, uh, we, were, we were proud to help FIGO in terms of developing the manual for training on obstetric, on obstetric fistula. And we were happy to support the first class of fellows to be trained with this manual at, for, uh, 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 with support from J&J &J and the Fistula Foundation. So right now with uh, 10 surgeons trained and seven facilities accredited and 30 experts who are trained to implement the training program, we think that this has been a really good success in terms of turning out people who are competent to treat the women who have need, who have, who need the surgery. And it's not an easy thing to do. Even though the surgery in many cases is done quickly, one surgeon told me it's like fixing a hole in the sole of the boot through the top of it. It's not an easy thing. It takes a lot of skill. And I was, um, I, I, that made me think a great deal. And it also made me think about what facilities you need to be successful. And what we've seen with some of the fellows is that they go back to hospital operating suites that are ill-equipped for doing this surgery. Things like tilting tables, adequate lighting, infection control procedures, and the nursing support. Really, I think that may be the most critical thing right now, is getting a program like this that's aimed at the nurses. Because 
there are techniques that are used in one facility that are not used at another, and it would be really great to decide from a stand, from a, through, through evidence which of those techniques ought to be uh, re replicated much more broadly. Uh, so, uh, the, and the program's popular. As you can see, 91 applicants to take this training program, and I think that's kind of remarkable. I'm going to digress a moment because, I mean, who's doing this except through passion and a humanitarian spirit? This is not the surgery you learn to get rich. Right? This is somebody who you know you are now going to be working with the poorest people and the most disadvantaged people. And so anybody who even says, I want to learn how to do this, I have such admiration for. And in and, and 21 countries, I think that's pretty impressive too. So we think that more trained surgeons can lead to more women treated, but, but how do we know that after these, these surgeons are trained, that they are actually able to go back and implement, use their skill, and, and serve the public? with this skill. And so we, we've been doing some work with the Fistula Foundation to provide a small grant program. It's a re-granting program. They receive a sum of money and they're able then to offer it to these FIGO graduates to say, what do you need? What would help you to reach more people? And our metrics for this grant program are around more available more services provided, more availability to people. And also, in cases where it's felt that a certain a piece of equipment, for instance, might be limiting the range of services available, that's another metric because we're, we're saying that that, brought, that availability is important in terms of quality of care. Okay? And we're going to be following this closely and really trying to use this grant as a way to assess the effectiveness of the FIGO training, but also to identify what are the obstacles to, to effective practice to the surgeon who, that has been trained. And this can help us to figure out what sort of things we ought to offer these programs that you see, this 267 facilities that are doing this work in the future. The other thing that we've set aside some funding for is to create a community of practice. Because we feel that so often, most of those facilities that you saw there, you've got someone who's working alone with very little in the way of professional guidance or mentorship, not, no necess not necessarily an ability to seek consultation on cases that they may be dealing with. And so we feel that by helping to create this kind of community, that uh, we may see a learning community and a supportive community of doctors doing this work. I want to, I think I'm very nearly out of time, but I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to ask you to indulge me a little bit to talk about this game called um, Half the Sky. Now, many of you probably saw the book by uh, Cheryl Wu Dunn and uh, Nicholas Kristof. And uh, I mean, it's a great book, and it was a great film series on PBS. And one of the things that Games for Change did was to produce a computer game called Half the Sky. And it was meant to educate people on the situation of women in developing nations and what a challenge women had. Um, and we, uh, there, we decided to work once again with the Fistula Foundation to provide a, a grant of a quarter of a million dollars and ask if this could be unlocked by people playing this game. So if people play the game, maybe learn a little something about it, learn a little bit about the, you know, the development and about the needs of women and about obstetric, obstetric fistula, they could uh, play and learn and also uh, re unlock this money. And so far, they've unlocked just most, most of it. It will be done, done soon. And we've got it, we learned a few things about this. One of the things was that this is a PC-based game. If we ever do something like this again, we're going to definitely want it to be a mobile game. Because all we, we got the, the college co-ops at Johnson & Johnson interested in this. And the first thing they said was, well, I've got to play this at my desk. I don't want to do that. I want to play this on my, on my tablet. I want to play this on my phone while I'm standing in line at, somewhere or waiting for, my, for the dryer to finish drying my clothes. So 
we, we learned a good lesson there, but it has nevertheless been successful. And, but, and, but at the heart of it all, we feel that getting public and private donors interested in this issue is a big challenge for us in the years ahead. It always kind of surprises, I, and let's face it, it's not a pretty kind of a problem. I mean, there's nothing about this that you're gonna enjoy talking about. But still, when I mention this effort to people, it is a rare person outside of the medical field who has heard of it or has any concern about it. And I really feel that if we ever do, if we were to talk about advocacy, reaching to the public and reaching to the private donors, the foundations, corporations, and the general public is an important thing for support for this to continue. And we would love to see a coordinated effort among the various players to make some, perhaps through social media, and particularly if it was aimed at younger people, to try to build a future stream of interest and support for this work. I thank you very much for your time. All right, we can all admit it. We're going to go home tonight and log into that game. Uh, I, I actually, before you made the comment about mobile phones, I was like, oh, I was going to say that. We're all going to get on our phones. But, um, but we're going to get that other 50,000 or so, right? We're going to uncover that. Um, that, that, was, that was really interesting. Um, really interesting to hear about. It was also really inspiring to hear about 80% of the global need around sutures being addressed by Johnson & Johnson. And so, you know, we talk about the worlds that we bring together here at the Wilson Center and, and the, the private and the corporate world is really important. There's a huge role that, that you all play and it was wonderful to hear more, more about it and very innovative outside of the, the games as well. We're now going to turn our attention to Dr. Lori Ramanzi. Um, she is the project director of the Fiscula Care Plus program at Engender Health. Um, she's also going to talk to us a bit more about prolapse. What was um, really neat about putting this panel together is when I called Mary Ellen and said that, uh, you know, we're working with Lori, and I think they also had a conversation before, and I, I don't want to take words from, from Mary Ellen's mouth, but th that she almost verbatim said um, how, uh, how some of the comments Lori provided at a previous panel um, changed uh, her view around prolapse laps and her work around that. So um, that was wonderful to hear her excitement in having Lorraine join us today and, it, and we share that excitement as well. And if you are interested in her, her, um, her, her comments from the last time, you can also find those online. So Lori. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just, it's up and running? It is. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I would like to thank again Sandeep for putting this together, and also to Sarah Craven from UNFPA DC office, who made both the first panel a couple of years ago possible, along with uh, Sandeep's organ fabulous organization here at the Wilson Center. Also to my co-panelists, oh, we all know each other very well, thank you very much, and Mary Ellen is now my direct mentor, along with Aaron Mielke at USAID in my new role as project director for Fistula Care Plus. It's interesting, I think, uh, Sandeep, that with the first panel, it was very much about what we were going to do or not do in relation to fistula, and it's just fabulous to see how far along the arc we've moved in terms of we're now talking about how we're going to do what we're going to do, and fabulous things like video games, which is brilliant to get young people in wealthy countries invested in something much lar larger than themselves through something they turn to every day to get away from the bigger picture and now we're just going to bring it back home. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> 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 so I, again, the, the title of this talk was not really fistula and prolapse. It, the title of today is about new developments and best practices as we transform our narrative on maternal morbidities and this is a an excellent time to do so because we are at the end of the Millennium Development Goals where a certain narrative was created, very effective, and now all of the MDGs are being reconsidered and being transformed into sustainable development goals that will guide us for the next uh, decade and a half, I think. So it's a great time to think about how we're doing what we're doing with regard to maternal morbidities in general, and I think there's no better illustration of that whole dynamic 
than to talk about obstructed labor and obstetric fistula. So when we, when we talk about funding uh, morbidity care, any kind of morbidity care in low and middle income nations, we're talking about something that's a little bit less finite than mortality care. Mortality is easier to measure. It's binary. You either survive or don't survive. Um, there's an end, there's a finiteness to it. But when it comes to morbidities care, you, you're not sure where to draw the line. And so we need to create a framework. And perhaps that framework could start with a platform of equity. And the uh, primary output could be one of sustainable transformation, which basically means that you've you have instigated change and capacity to the degree that external funding can be substantively withdrawn and you leave behind an intrinsically effective system that feeds and cares for itself in large part. How are we going to get there? Because equity is a big ticket, is it not? And when it comes to maternal morbidities, the equity we're talking about is between poor and wealthy nations. The degree to which women in poor countries suffer maternal morbidity and mortality is obscenely large compared to the degree to which that occurs for women in high income nations. And you can just ask any pregnant woman in a high income nation how she feels about being pregnant. And uniformly, she's quite happy about it usually. Whereas if you ask a woman in a low or middle income country how she feels about being pregnant, she will probably be happy, but she will also be very fearful. And making that fear go away is arguably one of the hallmarks of equity when it comes to maternal morbidity. So that interface, if we're going to get there from the concept of equity to sustainable transformation, has to invest in efficiencies, efficiencies of all resources, personnel, money, time, skill, training. It has to come from all sectors, industry, academic, um, social funders, international funders. Obstetric fistula highlights this phenomenon very well. Thanks for that. Because it comes from obstructed labor. Obstructed labor is a woman in labor for usually two or more days. And when the baby is wedged tightly in there, was for our vanishing image there, that is a woodcut from, that is my old Jeep from 19. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. In the snow. <laughs> I was my Israeli friend out for her very first snowstorm. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's do it again. Let's get a slideshow. So I'll get there in a second. What happened to everything? Everything got miniature over here. All right, no one. I don't know what. I think because it's connected to this thing. Let me just go. Can you help me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fix it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So when babies are stuck in the pelvis, because they're ju it's just not a good fit, all sorts of soft tissue damage can occur, and many, 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 many things can occur. And for instance, in the beginning of the UNFPA, um, thank you, video, yes, she had a fistula, which is a horrible, terrible thing. But what did she say? She said, I had the baby, the baby was dead, and then I realized I could not walk. Foot drop is a devastating consequence of obstructed labor. And if you're a, re a remote living women who, woman whose job involves carrying heavy things and farming in a remote area where there are no roads, there's no public transport, there's no such thing as a sidewalk, and your, your, your life is your body, and now you can't walk, that also is a significant problem of all of the morbidities that women have suffer, suffered as a result of surviving obstructed labor. So if they, sur if they survive it, they often are damaged permanently. Obstetric fistula has taken the lead in highlighting this, the, the sequelae of this condition, though many other things can occur. Infertility, chronic pelvic pain, severe soft tissue fibrosis that prevent the woman from living a normal reproductive life, uh, incontinence without fistula that can be quite severe, foot drop, separation of the pelvic bones that make it difficult to walk and create a lot of pain. Fistula has gotten a lot of attention, and deservedly so. It is a horrible condition. These women live lives that are worse than lepers. But there are many other morbidities as well. And so that's one of the things we need to think about when we think about efficacy and efficiency. We also have to backtrack. If we want to eradicate fistula, and we can, we did it in high-income countries at the turn of the 20th century. 
We had fistula everywhere in the world until the turn of the 20th century. In fact, the world's first fistula hospital was on the site of today's Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York on 51st End Park, and it was torn down because it was no longer necessary due to, I think, the advent of early forms of general anesthesia. Before the early 1900s, there was no anesthesia, but with the advent of chloroform and ether, it transformed surg surgery of all sorts, including making cesarean sections much more uh, user-friendly. Now, so we still have obstructed labor everywhere in the world. We have it here today in Washington, D.C., but we pick it up in its earliest form and we actively manage it. And very often, but not always, these women end up with cesarean section. In fact, early obstructed labor is the number one reason for doing a cesarean section in women who are pregnant for the first time by a huge margin. And we know that in countries where fistula is occurring, in many of them, the population-based cesarean delivery rate is at or under 5 percent. Now, the optimal rate at which mortality is minimized is allegedly around 15 percent, according to certain epidemiologic studies. So we're looking at doubling, tripling, quadrupling of the cesarean section rate in countries where we want to eradicate end-stage obstructed labor to prevent obstetric fistula. And on that point of high suspense, I'm going to stop because Carolyn Maloney is here, our Congresswoman. Thank you. You're, you're just stopping um, for a few moments because we do want to hear the end of this um, very engaging um, presentation. Um, uh, the Congresswoman is here. She is working her way upstairs. Um, in um, the meantime, I want to turn this over to uh, my coworker, Roger Mark D'Souza. He's the Director of Population Environmental Security and Resilience, who's going to be providing an opening for her. And I do think she's just just a few seconds out. Um, but um, maybe while we do wait for her, we can use this opportunity for any clarifying questions with the understanding that as soon as the Congresswoman walks in, um, we're going to um, need to stop that. But just clarifying questions, because we are trying to save um, some time for discussion. Um, we also have a reception uh, afterwards um, as well. And, and you are free to, to um, enjoy uh, the delicious snacks we have, um, and also um, engage with our speakers then. And actually, during the, the, the reception, we have a, a, an additional treat in addition to the fried food. And actually, maybe while folks are collecting their, um, their thoughts um, on clarifying questions, we can hear a little bit more about the quilt that, um, that is being showcased. So can we get a microphone um, to Katie, who can talk, uh, a talk about it? OK. Oh, perfect. Thanks. I'll be brief because I, I don't want to. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for having me today. My name is Katie Pettit, and I work for the Advocacy Project. It's a DC based international nonprofit. We work with marginalized communities around the world um, to tell their stories, to claim their rights, and to produce social change. Um, we really believe in the power of stories, and hearing these stories today have been really moving. Um, and. The quote we have today is from Nepal and 13 women in, in Nepal who um, had the prolapse, uterine prolapse surgery, and they told their story in a quilt square. So downstairs, you'll be able to see their story um, and read a little bit more about that. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that so we have enough time. Yeah. Thank you. I know that uh, we were particularly um, a honored to have the quilt being showcased, especially post-earthquake, um, and having the stories of um, Nepali women in particular. So were there any clarifying questions while we wait for that um, like slow elevator, apparently? <laughs> or, or perhaps I, I jumped the gun in hearing the news that she was here. Um, Do you want me to keep going with my um, Oh, I think there's a clarifying question on the side there. Thank you. Zabel Zakarian, can you hear me? Is it on? Speak up. Maybe just a little closer. Okay, thank you. Zabel Zakarian. Could uh, someone on the panel clarify the approximate rates of 
prolapse in mothers who give birth at home versus in a hospital type setting oh, yeah. in the developing world. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question uh, for which there's absolutely no data, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, there, there is data correlating what data they do. I'm sorry, that's really not fair because I would have to look at the detailed assessment that was done in some of the recent studies in Nepal and um, Ethiopia. The challenge with those environments is that almost everyone is delivering at home. And so you don't, you have confounding that you can't quite overcome. But we know that um, having many babies is a risk factor not only for fistula but also for prolapse and having a long labor well within the accepted normal limits, but having a longer labor within the normal li limits of, of labor length is also a risk factor in developing nations, as is heavy carrying, as is um, living also in a highland region as opposed to a lowland, which I don't really understand except maybe the heavy carrying is more difficult there or the nutrition is less robust, we don't really know. In wealthy nations, we have a lot of data about uh, risk factors. That while there is some nurture, there's also a lot of nature in it. There's a lot of, uh, in wealthy nations where there is every advantage in the population of women who have prolapsed compared to women in poor countries, you see um, biochemical markers that are markers of hyperelasticity. And so prolapse is also possibly a, a bit of a genetic component to it when we do matched controls with equal parity and age, women who have prolapse and women who don't, and take a very scientific look at their connective tissue, there's a distinct difference in the elasticity components. And so, but what's really interesting out of uh, poor countries is that you still have communities who do a lot of really strenuous daily heavy lifting from like the time they're eight until they die, while they're pregnant, immediately postpartum, many times a day, every day of the week, back and forth. So you can look at that factor in a way you can't look at in wealthy nations, and there's a distinct difference there. And I've also seen it. If, when I'm in Congo, where there's a lot of heavy lifting, I've seen even virgins come in with uterine prolapse. If I go right across the lake into Rwanda, the only women I see with prolapse are the older women who are farmers, and they're well into their advanced 70s, and then finally they get prolapse. But you don't see virgins with prolapse in Rwanda because you don't see women doing all that heavy carrying. It's interesting. Thank you for the question. An interesting answer as well. Um, anything else clarifying? I can't necessarily see that side of the room. Um, well, again, maybe <laughs> since I apparently jumped the gum, um, maybe we can use this moment. I, I'd hate to have you come back it's up. Okay. Um, but. <laughs> It's like green eggs and ham. I can do this talk any way you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we were talking about cesarean section rates and, um, and the fact that to eradicate obstetric fistula, which is possible, it's been proven, it's happened in the course of human history in certain regions of the world. The fact that it persists today is not only unfair, it's a little bit enraging. So we can eradicate end-stage obstructed labor, and the way you do that is through cesarean section. But in the regions where obstructed labor continues to go to end-stage, causing death or disability, including fistula, we have fairly low cesarean section rates, and we know that those cesarean, 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 help me, cesarean section rates <laughs> will have to increase many-fold in order to get to some reasonable standard of care. They must, how many midwives do we have here? Okay, there we go. These two are shaking their heads like this <laughs> the whole time. Um, so we know that. And here's the challenge. So to reduce obstetric fistula, we must increase cesarean section rates. And yet, even with these low cesarean section rates in obstetric fistula zones, we are seeing a growing proportion of women coming in with iatrogenic fistula. How many people know what iatrogenic means? It means that it's bad care caused the fistula, and it's surgical. And we have this uh, reported in 15% of the caseload of fistula that we are dealing with and helping manage in the P Fistula Care Plus project. We also have a, a very respected, uh, excellent fistula surgeon who recently publishes 18 years worth of data, 13.2% were iatrogenic fistula caused by surgery done poorly. 
most of it from cesarean, a nice margin of it from fundal pressure, my midwifery colleagues. Thank you. And so we see real challenges. You can instantly see this very threatening dynamic occurring. As we increase cesarean sections for obstructed labor, are we just going to transform a big portion of them into iatrogenic fistula? What have we gained? They are much more complicated and much more likely to damage the kidney, iatrogenic fis uh, fistula compared to obstetric. And it's not just a skills issue, although we have to look at that. Medical students are turned out into the community with no surgical training to do every surgery, including cesarean, and they're not doing a good job. Midwives don't often get adequate training, or even if they do when they go out, they're working under absurd conditions that no one could do a good job in, and they use a lot of fundal pressure because they have to get those babies delivered. They've got two on the bed, one on the floor, um, and we have to look at other issues as well, the, the conditions under which these clinicians are working. We have midwives who would be better off in Rwanda. I work with midwives who said, I, I would rather be a driveway guard. I would make three times what I make as a midwife. They're working two and three jobs. They're exhausted all the time. Then they go to work, and they've got 20 patients per midwife. Who can do a good job under that condition? We have to start looking at things like patient to midwife ratio. I know of a hospital in West Africa that just feeds the fistula center down the hill because they're doing 15,000 deliveries. They went from 5,000 deliveries a year to 15 when they improved funding for maternity care, which is a great thing, right? But they forgot to build some more operating theaters, so they still have one operating theater for 15,000 patients. It's an, it's an obstetric fistula factory. They just, they labor for four or five days because they're the last ones to get into the theater. They're not bleeding, they're not having seizures, they don't have a fever, so they're the last ones to get their cesarean section or not, and then they roll them down the hill to the fistula center. We have to start <laughs> looking at these conditions in addition to how people are getting their skills and whether, whether or not these skills are adequate, in addition to infrastructure, electricity, water, waste management, supplies, thank you, Conrad. Supplies, supplies, supplies. We have to have adequate and uh, affordable supplies coming into these countries. We can't be doing donations forever. The equation for fistula eradication is very simple as Aaron Anastasi alluded to earlier, you prevent new cases, and then you efficiently identify and effectively treat the established cases. Fairly straightforward, yes? If we are going to mobilize resources to identify cases, or prevent, in, in order to prevent new cases, we have to know what's causing the fistula in any given community. And while some of them are currently being funded we fund obstructed labor fistula. We are now funding iatrogenic fistula by default. We've also accepted that sexual trauma can be a source of fistula, and we repair those as well. Some fistula are not amenable to surgery, and some fistula get mixed, missed, just either because they don't come in or they're coming from some other cause. But wouldn't it be wise if we really want to harmonize our efforts with the healthcare systems in these countries, why not give them the information that they need to do the job they ultimately need to do for their community and tell them about all of the things we're seeing when we do a fistula screening camp, even if we don't put them on the table and do surgery. I think that this is a helpful thing to do that's cross-cutting and ultimately wise. Identifying fistula patients is an ongoing challenge, as was brought up with uh, my colleagues at the panel. It's very stigmatizing, extremely. That's, that's not the only hurdle, but it's one of the bi biggest. And if we know that most of these fistula, so far, are coming from obstructed labor, and we know that obstructed labor causes many other very severe quality of life, high impact conditions that also ruin the woman's life, why not think about proposing and funding and creating obstructed labor screening programs? I call fistula screening programs the truffle hunt. We're out there looking for the truffles. They're hard to find, and then they're hiding, and then it's a big challenge to find them. We mobilize healthcare community workers, and we do community outreach, and we do public service announcement, all about fistula, fistula, fistula. Wouldn't it be simpler if we said, we have a program for all women who have been in labor for more than two days. If you've been in labor for more than two days, or you know someone who's been in labor, please, we know they're suffering, bring them in. And then we can begin to utilize our, our resources possibly much more effectively. 
Again, if you can't walk from bilateral foot drop, it's great to have your fistula fixed. But there are also treatments for foot drop. And she's in that hospital for two weeks post-op, and nobody's paying attention to the fact that she can't walk much of the time. Treatment. We're witnessing a, tr uh, a transformation in the way fistula treatment is funded that also cross-cuts and helps us deal with other maternal morbidities as well. We're moving toward an integrated service delivery that engages economies of scale and scope, and we've spoken about that. We'll, I'll elaborate on that a bit further. And in terms of monitoring the programs that have been put in place, obviously we always want to make sure that externally funded programs are safe and effective. That's our job. So we call that monitoring and evaluation. But what we have now is a dynamic. We've been in country long enough that we can begin, I think, to interface with the monitoring systems at the clinical level in country, below the aggregate level, and start to mentor and review and assist in the development of quality assurance-based clinical monitoring through simple things like registries that would match symptoms to diagnoses and treatments to outcomes, and we begin to model quality assurance in a very real-life way, possibly. And why couldn't we, when we're thinking about finding fistula, or, I'm sorry, uh, when we're, yes, when we're thinking about finding fistula and we're imagining that we could do obstruct, obstructed labor, labor screening programs, why not take something like this brand new curriculum from the East Central Southern African healthcare community that task shifts fistula care using uh, catheters, thank you, toward nurses and midwives and take this amazing curriculum, which you can find online. I encourage you all to go look at it. It's a remarkable body of work. Take this, expand it just a bit, and turn it into an obstructed labor screening program. Not only might that not be wiser, I think it's a fabulous new acronym. Now, I, I'm going to sit down again, <laughs> and we're going to see what happens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lori, especially for your flexibility. It's happening. <laughs> I, I promise. Um, and then we will, of course, let you um, have the opportunity to finish up as well. Quick, quick. I will. It is happening. <laughs> See? <laughs> Hello, Hello. 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 As, as you will see, she has introduced bipartisan legislation that authorizes aid to multilateral partners such as UNFPA and the Campaign to End Obstetric Fistula, as well as to bilateral organizations such as USAID to aid in the prevention and treatment of obstetric fistula in foreign countries. She's a champion for domestic and international women's issues, and we were just chatting, and she said that you know she had, had launched the campaign looking at where are the woman and she said to me you know Raj Mark I've prepared a series of comments um, but I almost want to talk about what just happened on the floor I don't want to read a series of prepared comments I really want to talk about an action plan and what we can concretely do right now so I like those fighting words <laughs> so congresswoman welcome Thank you. I'm so honored to be here, and I thank uh, all of you for being here and caring about these issues. As, uh, as Mother Teresa said, it's, it's not that, that I do this work, it's that I like to do this work. And uh, I, I think that uh, in many times uh, when we are working for women, it's often, with the exception of the pres president we have now that is so supportive uh, of women's issues, that uh, 
that a lot of times you you feel like you're out there all by yourself working uh, on trying to get things done and I I want to thank uh, very much the Wilson Center and and Jane Harmon was one of my favorite um, members she's extraordinarily talented uh, hard-working smart uh, you're fortunate to have her as your leader and I I send her my best regards. Uh, I, I, I am here today in support of all of the programs that America stands for that help women and children. And, and two of my favorites, USAID and UNFPA, are on the, on the panel right up here. I, I just uh, want to say that uh, the numbers are roughly that 800 women die every day due to childbirth com complications or the birth of a child. And yet uh, that's about the same as a 747 falling. And look at all the press and attention when a 747 falls, yet uh, so many of our issues, we have to fight so hard to get the political will and the resources uh, to do what's important. And I, I can tell you that USAID and UNFPA saves uh, millions of lives uh, by, by providing maternal health care and, and being there, whether it's an earthquake or a, or a health problem or just everyday life in, in providing uh, the assistance. Uh, on fistula, I do have a, a fistula bill in that would provide resources and support for fistula. And two summers ago, I was in Ethiopia and in Addis Abeba, went to the fistula clinic there. And uh, for, for roughly $400 or less, you can repair a fish, fistula sufferer. Why aren't we doing this? Uh, so that they can have productive lives and, and go forward. Uh, they, they are scorned by their families, they're incontinent, and, and they, uh, they have problems, and, and we can correct it, really, if we just had the political will uh, to make that happen. I, I know that every year one of my priorities is to have a sharp pencil for USAID and UNFPA. And uh, oftentimes, uh, when you're trying to do something to help people, it gets camouflaged with other totally unrelated items that uh, have nothing to do with it. And I, I'm distressed about what happened uh, on the floor today, and I want to share it with you, because this is a, a, a true life example of what's happening. And uh, I was just sharing with, 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 the, with Sarah Craven and others on, when we were talking, I, I started this movement called Where Are the Women? Uh, where I would question whenever they had these panels uh, on women's health or anything related to our reproductive health or our health in general, they'd have all these men talking and no women and they say they weren't expert enough. Well, I can assure you any woman is more expert on a woman's health uh, than someone who's not a woman and, and because they confront it every day. So I started this whole thing on where are the women, you know, and raised hell on it and uh, votes on the floor on it and questioning every panel that didn't have a woman on it and all this kind of thing. It became a national movement, came out in the, the, the last election. But now I'm beginning to say where are the women when it comes to standing up for other women's issues and women's issues. Uh, we are half the population. And believe me, more than half the population, the women's vote is even larger. If we just stuck together on an issue, we would change America and change it. We should just say we're not going to vote for any candidate that doesn't support uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, I spend three-fourths of my time in Congress holding on to what we already had. You know, there's a constant wave trying to roll back rights that we've already earned. And what does the Equal Rights Amendment says that we should just have equality of rights? That's as fundamental to American values as, as anything. And if we just stood up on these issues and voted together, we, we'd win. But on the other hand, we've made great progress. I can tell you, when I was the age of some of these young women I see around here, I never in my farthest dreams ever thought that a woman would be treated seriously as a Democratic candidate. And earlier today, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton spoke at the caucus for uh, the Democrats. And it's, I firmly believe that she will be the Democratic nominee. I believe she will win that nomination. And, and that means she has a one in two shot of being President of the United States. Now, I'm a Hillary supporter. I'm going to do everything I can to help her get elected. But coming from where we were, where we were just basically kept down and back and told to shut up and uh, of course you're lucky to be in the room and we're going to pay you a tenth of what we're paying everyone else and and uh, you know it, it's just been a hard hard battle 
But we've made incredible progress in my lifetime. I, I never thought we'd have an African-American president, and we have. I never thought we'd have gay rights approved uh, for marriage with the Supreme Court. I introduced one of the first bills on a domestic partnership on the city council, and they refused to print it. They said it was unconstitutional. That's how bad it was. Literally, I'm telling you the truth. We will not print it. It's unconstitutional. How dare you try to even print this idea? I, and to see the change and that this was affirmed uh, by, by, the, by the Supreme Court and that the Confederate flag has gone down and the, and the rainbow colors are going up. I mean, there's been a lot of change and a, and a lot that has taken place in this country that is, that is very, very important. But it still distresses me that we always have to fight against the gag rule, that we have to uh, fight for UNFPA. They go out and probably save more lives than any other program, and yet you have to fight every year uh, to get uh, just, uh, just the funding for them. But, but back to what's happening in Congress. Uh, what I love about my job is that you can actually make things happen. You can make things happen. You really can. And so when the Republicans came in with what they call sequestration, that means that they are flat funding that they will not improve the funding in any area. So I said, well, you know, how can we get around that? So one of the areas that I work on every year is women's health and uh, breast cancer research. One of the things that I wanted to do when I came to Congress was double the funding. Well, we've more than tripled, quadrupled the funding for breast cancer research, but still too many people, 40,000 a year, die of breast cancer. So I got a Republican colleague and said, let's do a coin, a coin bill. And how it works is you have a program that matches the money, so it has to be a substantial program. And you print a coin, and the American public, then with their dollars, can fund the research. So the two leading uh, organizations in America in breast cancer research is the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, uh, founded by Evelyn Lauder, and uh, Susan G. Komen. And so Susan G. Komen is, is headquartered in Texas, so I asked Pete Sessions, a, a leader in his party, to, to join with me. And so we were going to the floor. We had over 309 co-sponsors. We go down to the floor. It's all music. We're passing the bill. It could mean $8 million additional funding for breast cancer research. Uh, you can say, well, that's not enough, but at least it's $8 million. It's better than nothing, and, and you're here. You might as well get something done. Little do I know, the Republicans, or some of them, go down, and they object. They object to the bill. And to me, on the Democratic side, the Democrats were objecting to the bill because Susan G. Komen is getting some of the money, and in their past, they had moved to defund breast cancer, re uh, to do defund Planned Parenthood. And of course, there was an outcry, uh, and they then continued to fund it. Planned Parenthood not only helps in family planning, they do provide abortions, but it's the number one provider of health care. Uh, for young women in our nation, particularly women who do not have means. In, in my district, which is a wealthy district, you can go to the Planned Parenthood uh, office, and women are lined up literally around the corner uh, after work trying to come in to get information, to get health care. It's a phenomenally important health care provider. So they're objecting because Susan G. Komen funds uh, Planned Parenthood the number one health care provider, uh, but they do provide abortions. And they're going to kill the daggone bill. So we just pulled it. I, I can't believe it that these cultural warfare things are going on. Uh, I'm going to try to figure out how to save it when I leave here. But I, I'm sitting there. I said, you talk about getting a headache. You know, it doesn't cost any taxpayer money. It's a creative way to provide research. And yet they're protesting because some of the money is going to an organization that provides basic health care to women. And, uh, you know, I, uh, we've, we've got to stop, uh, we've got to stop uh, allowing uh, this to happen. And uh, my staff says to me, it's never easy. Well, that's true, it's never easy. But to me, it's almost stupidity when you look at this. And uh, I was thinking about it. It's the second time this year that I've gone to a floor with a bill that costs no money absolutely not one sit, but that it helps and it empowers women. And oh, that's what this organization does, among others. You want to empower women. It helps and empowers women, and it has been almost killed and protested beyond belief. And I, um, 
since I came to Congress, every year I, I introduced the Equal Rights Amendment uh, because how can we expect to be treated fairly if we can't even have our Constitution say that men and women should have equal opportunity? I think it's very important. It's perception. It's a, a very important uh, item, yet there's tremendous pushback uh, on, on this particular in, in endeavor and in, in to, to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. But uh, I tell you, the fight today was, to me, uh, you know, just sad, <laughs> sad that they are doing this. So for 15 years, I was trying to pass a bill. I was walking around the mall, and I saw museums for stamps, for law and order, for every ethnic group in America, uh, for everything in America except women. And I thought, this is easy. Let's put a bill in that says that women should be treated uh, uh, you know, have a museum that talks about their achievements. Well, you would have thought all hell broke loose. There was all this opposition to it. You know, we might put Margaret Sanger in it. I mean, all this stuff, you know, and, and, uh, and I couldn't believe it. So I finally studied it. I said, why am I losing on something that doesn't cost, that usually with the Republicans, their number one mantra is no money. So if you start off with no money, then, then maybe you have a prayer. But uh, they, they were totally opposed. This goes on for 15 years. And so I decided I'm going to find the most pro-life woman I can find, and we're going to work together. So I got Marsha Blackburn, who's very respected on the Republic, Republican side. She was a wonderful ally, a wonderful friend. I never could have passed the bill without her. We put the bill in, and every time they would go to the floor and say, you can't have the Women's Museum because it's all about abortion, she would stand up and say, it's not about abortion. It's about women's achievements. It's about their contributions to America, and these contributions need to be recognized. And even with her help, we couldn't pass it. We finally had to attach it to the defense authorization bill. <laughs> you know, a must pass, the defense of the nation. And we finally passed it. So I'm sitting there, what is this negativity coming from? And what can we do uh, to combat it? And I think that we've got to, whenever we see it, we've got to fight it. We've got to fight it with the facts. You know, uh, they always go after UNFPA. They say, well, maybe they fund abortions. Well, we know that Hyde is part of the, part of the law of the land. We are not using federal money for abortions. But no matter how many times you say that, they go to the floor and say it's a complete and total lie. And, uh, and, and how our, our uh, bodies become part of the internal fighting in Congress is just, uh, is just something beyond me. But I think we shouldn't take it. We should, whenever we see it, we've got to stand up and say it's discriminatory. It has nothing to do with what we're trying to do. We're trying to save lives. We're trying to provide health care. We're trying to, fight, to provide research. And we're trying to get out there and get the job done. And uh, that's what we need to do. And uh, I got, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one story because I think it tells you how hard it is to get anything done. And it's almost beyond belief. It's almost funny. Um, but uh, then I'd like a discussion on what we can work on. But I want to go, then I want to hit Boko Haram very seriously. Uh, I tell you, uh, when I came to Congress in 92 with President Clinton, and then in 94 we lost the House. And then one of these nights when we're working late, uh, uh, Patricia Schroeder came to me on the floor, and she said, it's going to take a New York woman to get the New York women out of the basement. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, when Alice Paul head of the Women's Party, let's get that Women's Party going again, girls, okay, and boys, like-minded men. Uh, she commissioned a statue of the three suffragette leaders, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Lucretia Mott, and Susan B. Anthony, to be put in the rotunda when we passed the bill. So when they passed the 19th Amendment, giving women half the population the vote, probably the biggest revolutionary uh, empowerment in the history of our country. Half of our country was empowered with that vote. Um, they, they, she had the statue moved into the rotunda. Now, it sat in the rotunda for something like three days, and then they took the inscription, calling it blasphemous, and took it off. I'm going to put in a bill next week to put the inscription back on. Mm. You've got to help me pass it. The inscription said something like, women empowered with the vote will, for women first call mindless, then called soulless, 
empowered with the vote, will stand up and realize their full potential. They call this blasphemous, took the statue and threw it in the basement, in the crypt. So I said, this is easy. It's just symbolic. Sim it took me four years to move the stupid statue. So I put in the bill with Connie Morella, a like-minded, um, wonderful uh, Republican congresswoman, and all hell broke loose. We even did a newsletter on all the excuses worth printing. You know, the first one, the first one was, the first one was that uh, the rotunda could not hold it. So forget it. So we had to go out and raise $84,000, hire an engineer, and he did a report that the rotunda floor could, in fact, hold it. And this went on, all these excuses. My three favorite is they said, no new statues are moving, coming into the Capitol. Meanwhile, they moved the disgraced Vice President Agnew, who went to jail as a crook. They moved his statue in, because he was a man, and he was Vice President, even though he was a crook, so he comes in. And, and then, uh, you know, all of this goes on. And if you think about it, and you go into the rotunda, our revolutionary leaders are there, in the, and I call it the living room of the Capitol. You know, there's Washington and Hamilton and, and Grant and King and all of our great revolutionary leaders, all male, but no women. And yet these are our revolutionary leaders. Uh, Alice Paul was a, a distant relative of my late husband, so I know her story. I mean, they put her in an insane asylum. They put her in an insane asylum and force fed her because she had the idea that women should have the vote. Can you imagine? So no matter what problems we have, they are nothing compared to what these women went through for us to get the vote. So we finally got the bill passed, and we're going to move uh, the statue. And uh, the, the, the other one was that, 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 that it would cost too much money to move the statue. And they said it would cost $700,000. We had to go out and raise $700,000 to move the statue. Can you believe that? So this is a stru true story. We passed the bill. I'm so excited. Meanwhile, they take my name off the bill, so it no there's no record that a Democrat had anything to do with it. And then we're sitting there, and Connie Morella comes running into this. We have this room that is the women's room, sort of the gathering room. It's about a quarter of the size of this room. But at that time, we didn't have any mem women members. And she says, we can't move the statue because I just came from the Republican caucus meeting, and uh, they said we can't move it because the women are too ugly. And there's this very wonderful statue of this very attractive woman that we can move into the rotunda that no one had ever heard of. She, she, no one cared who he was or she was. And Schroeder, not missing a beat, said, well, have you looked at Lincoln recently? <laughs> Lincoln is not there for his looks. I, I think our founding mothers are beautiful, but they are there for what they accomplished for half this population. So, so right, ta right now, this is on my mind, and then I want to hear your ideas on it. You know, Boko Haram is just absolutely horrible, and uh, they are killing and raping, and uh, the disregard uh, for, for, for life, and particularly female life, is just... Uh, Horrifying. Now, everyone focuses on the girls of Shabbat, the 270 that were kidnapped, but they're kidnapping them all over the country. There's well over 2,000 have been kidnapped and uh, put into sexual slavery and uh, just terrible treatment. And uh, I am going to Africa on uh, the first week in August and uh, uh, meeting with the new president and also going to the Republic of Congo, which helped raise money from Central Africa, over 80 million, because good luck Johnson left with all the money and the new president didn't have any money to, fat, to fight Boko Haram. And uh, I feel that America standing up, uh, from the First Lady to all the women members of Congress, we wear red every Wednesday and uh, go to the floor and talk about it and raise awareness. And uh, just this week, uh, the, it's been in the paper that Boko Haram is saying that they would like to trade the women of Shabbat, the 200 that they have, uh, for other political prisoners that, that, that Nigeria has. I, for one, would support that. Let's get these girls out of there and bring them home. And, uh, and uh, let's get girls' education uh, going forward in Africa. 
And uh, one of the great schools that I have the privilege of representing, Barnard, is willing to go, or so they've indicated, uh, to these schools, to, to, to Africa, and help set up a, a girls' school that would, you know, really have a high high level education. So, so this is happening, and we should be doing something about what's happening there. I think that he would not be coming and trying to do a prisoner exchange if we hadn't raised it to such an extent. I, I know that I got the uh, the Empire State Building to light up on the on the hundredth day that they'd been in captivity, and it became an international story. It, wrote, it was in purple and red, the colors of, of, of the movement. But I, I just want to throw out that what can we do jointly to bring these girls home and, and raise the respect and treatment of girls and women in Africa. And I, I'm, I'm in a position to do something about it because I'm going on the first week in, in August and I'd love to hear your ideas of what we could go forward. Um, one idea is to do a letter to the State Department, uh, to John Kerry, on let's consider doing a prisoner exchange for these girls. And, and try to, to get them out. The other, of, of course, is supporting education and trying to bring the resources to the country in education. And, and then, of course, I just have to share with you, Jean Shaheen had a big victory in the Senate in, in removing the gag rule and providing funding for UNFPA, which I think is tremendously important. Thirty-five million, it's not enough, but it's there, and that's important. That is a success. And we have to applaud our successes in addition to looking at what else we have to do. But I, I uh, know that I have a lot of geniuses around the table. And I wanted to hear, and, and Sarah Crave, and I have to mention, uh, Sarah and I have grown up, uh, our children have grown up. Their little girls are now going to higher education and, and doing other kinds of great things. Are, are there any ideas that anyone would like to share on what we should be doing to combat Boko Haram? Yes. Uh -huh. Can, can you just wait for a mic so those tuning in can, can hear you? It's coming. Thank you. And then I'm willing to take any questions. Sure. My name is Patrice White. I'm with the American College of Nurse Midwives. Um, I recently spent a considerable amount of time in, in Nigeria. And so what I'm saying is based on thoughts and perceptions while I was there and input from Nigerian colleagues. Um, I think we have a tendency here to look at Boko Haram and, and maybe view it without a lot of context, that part of Nigeria is among the most undeveloped parts of Nigeria and was pretty much ignored by the central government through the last three or four regimes. Uh, Nigerian colleagues who spent time there talked to me about what the conditions were and they're abysmal for everyone. So I think we need to have some awareness that Boko Haram didn't um, start in a vacuum. It was a reaction against certain things that were happening politically in Nigeria. I think pressure needs to be put on the Nigerian government to really provide some some infrastructure in that part of the country. That's, that's a more complicated answer than you may want, but I really feel like us going in and just pushing on, on what we see right now is mm -hmm. not going to be a long-term mm -hmm. fix. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other ideas? Is UNFPA and USAID in, in uh, Nigeria? And if so, what are you doing there to help the people? Yeah, I think there's one, one mic and then you can. Oh, sorry. Um, so this isn't exactly combating Boko Haram, but this is sort of helping the girls who have been victims of being kidnapped. Um, right now, the Helms Amendment, that uh, the current interpretation of it, currently has all um, organizations uh, like ban that receive any funding banned from performing abortion services even when it's legal in the country in cases of rape and incest and when it's uh, for the health of the woman. And in Nigeria, abortion to save the life of the woman is currently legal, but because of the current interpretation of the Helms Amendment, no organization that receives U.S. funding can help those women. And um, of, they recently rescued about 250 women in Nigeria from Bogo Haram, and over 200 of them were pregnant. Oh God. And nothing could be done about that through U.S. funding. And all it takes is a call from President Obama to USAID to basically clarify that the way the law is written, funding can be used in the case of rape, incest, and, uh, rape, incest in the life of the mother. Um, but that just hasn't been done. So I think putting pressure 
like on him just to clarify it with a call, no law needs to be passed. I think that could be hugely beneficial in that case. So clarify it for me. We do have the Hyde Amendment that says no federal funding can be used for an abortion, right? Helms is the international version of that law. Pardon me? Helms is the international version of the Hyde Amendment. The Helms Amendment is the international. So you're saying, I, I, but isn't that international, the, 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 uh, the, the groups that are in Nigeria that would perform abortion, aren't they international? I might not be the best person to talk about this, but um, but let me let me ask Sarah because you are uh, you don't don't we have the Hyde Amendment that says no federal fund? Um, you no, know, legally, can you? Uh, Excuse me. Um, even if there's an exception of rape or incest, under the law, it doesn't prohibit the funding, but under the current interpretation of the law, it does prohibit the funding. So I think what she was just saying is that we're calling for a reinterpretation of the Helms Amendment. Well, well, the problem is that you have um, is that the Senate and the House are controlled by Republican leadership. Uh, they, they won't even allow an individual to buy a coin and, uh, and uh, support research for breast cancer research because they, in an unrelated action, gave money to Susan G. Komen. Susan G. Komen gave an un unrelated uh, action, gave money to uh, a Planned Parenthood. So that shows you, even if the president came out and said that, they would just pass a bill and say, you know, uh, you know, if this organization wants to send me a letter that they would like the president to clarify it, uh, you know, I will certainly call his office and write a letter in support of having it clarified. But knowing what's happening in Congress, even if he clarified it, they would then just overpower it. Uh, I do want to say that the president, in my opinion, has been very, very um, sensitive to family issues. And I was stunned in his last uh, State of the Union he didn't wait till the end of the speech, but like the third or fourth paragraph into his speech, he went into work family balance and the need for, for paid leave for the birth of a child. We are among three countries in the world that do not provide it, Pathwa, New Guinea, and Lesotho in the United States. I mean, it's, it's to me, scandalous, scandalous. We should be providing uh, paid leave for the birth of a child. And work family balance, and uh, the fact that uh, when you discriminate against a woman who is working, you're discriminating her fam against her family and her children. Very strong, strong statement on work-family balance. And uh, these are issues that uh, I started working on when I first came to Congress, and people would sort of laugh at me when I brought them up. You know, why are you talking about that? And the President of the United States making it central to his point of view and central to his agenda of what he wants to pass. And, I'm telling you, it, it puts a whole new feeling when he puts the bully pulpit behind something, that it's, these issues are being treated uh, seriously and they're being debated, and we may even be able to pass some of them uh, because of his strong uh, statement. But I would uh, like to, uh, you know, uh, work on what we can actually do. I think it's very interesting that one of the first bills before, the first thing that uh, President Clinton did, one of his first actions, his first executive action, was to repeal the gag rule. The first executive action of George W. Bush was to reinstate it. So isn't that interesting that our issues become like the central thing that uh, they're putting out there? When President Obama uh, came to office, the second thing he did was reinstate the gag rule. It wasn't the first thing he did. He did something else that was important. Too. But, but these issues are like front and center right in the uh, cultural debates between the, between the two parties. Uh, so they are, they are deep and they're strong. And as I said, they are killing a bill as we speak on the floor because <laughs> that has no federal money. So forget the Hyde rule. There's no federal money whatsoever. It, they are trying to kill it because they want to stop the individual's decision to use their own $5 to possibly buy a coin that would help 
breast cancer research and maybe some of that money would go to an organization that had helped the central most important provider of health care to women in our nation, Planned Parenthood. I mean, it is, to me, beyond belief. It's almost beyond belief. Are there any other statements or questions? Yes, uh -huh. Oh, Congressman, I was just going to jump in. I'm um, Sarah Craven with UNFPA, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for your passion and your energy. Um, you always uh, get us all thinking. And I, I do want to give a little piece of good news, which is um, we, UNFPA, uh, just signed an agreement with USAID along with UNICEF and WHO in northern Nigeria to provide um, primary health care to the most vulnerable women. And your point, or my colleague from the uh, midwives, is absolutely that that is an area that has been really ignored. And I think that also is a real testament to your leadership that we are now in a stage where UNFPA and USAID are signing these kind of agreements and working on the ground. And I think that's been a, a great uh, hallmark of um, UNFPA being refunded by the Obama administration. So uh, we, I think, um, Sandeep did a fantastic, and Roger Mark did a fantastic event on Nigeria a year ago. In, Decem in December. In December, Just a few months ago. Not six months ago, that I highly recommend people to focus on. And I think certainly from this conversation, I can already think of three or four more dialogues that uh, we should have. So I just want to say thank you for coming in. Um, I know uh, that we have more questions, and I know also we've got wine and cheese and an amazing quilt that I know we hope you see before you leave. So I'm going to turn it back. Well, I want to thank you very much, unless anybody else has another question. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Congresswoman. My name is Yet Nayet Yet Aswaw. I work for Engender Health. I am from Africa. I'm deeply moved by your uh, care for women and for women in Africa. When it comes to addressing the issue of Boko Haram and any other extremist, I see that we need to work with the local champions from all walks of life. Women and men and religious leaders and girls, everybody has to own this issue and ha have to feel the, the, the deep lows and have to set the parameters for anybody working there. People may be poor, but they can come up like with their own norms and regulations and boundaries to say no in our land. We cannot accept this. This kind of injustice and inequality, not on our land, men and women can say this. And identifying Nigeria is a country of over 150 million. Mm -hmm. Can we identify a number of champions who can really like create a grassroots mobilization for all the people to stand together and to say no to this kind of injustices. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was beautifully said. Um, I do know the new president of Nigeria is coming to America on the 20th as the guest of President Obama. I believe he invited President Obama to go to Nigeria. The president was not able to go, so he has invited him to come here. Uh, so I will certainly write the State Department to convey your feelings and th that they can convey to the new president uh, your feelings and, and I think uh, you're right in that all change really has to come from the people and, and it has to be uh, their ownership of, of uh, standing up for these rights. Anyway, I feel inspired seeing all of you. Thank you for having me and uh, let's work together to pass the Equal Rights Amendment to help uh, <laughs> Nigeria, to help USID, to uh, help UNFPA and to uh, repeal the Hyde Amendment. When I first came to Congress, I was going to repeal the Hyde Amendment. Well, I was not successful. <laughs> but I haven't been given up. Yet. <laughs> yet, yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that was better than the Yeah, that was great. So, so we're going to resume um, Lori's comments in just a moment. And, and, and maybe while we all um, settle back and, and Lori makes her way here after um, 
uh, after saying goodbye to the Congresswoman, who again, we're, we really appreciate um, um, coming to join us today. Um, I will just quickly reference um, the, the, the event that Sarah mentioned. We traveled in December to Nigeria and uh, in collaboration with the, uh, the you know, I know everything by acronyms, and that's horrible. No your organization saves. So the Center for Population and Reproductive Health at the University of Ibadan, we helped put together a full-day conference um, with maternal health experts there, um, which we, the rollout from the conference of key takeaways, we then video conferenced an audience here, which could have included you. I was in, in uh, Abuja, so I don't know who was in the room here. Um, but so you can see that online, and that's the dialogue between Washington, D.C. and Abuja. So. Um, again, turning this back to, um, to Lori, um, we are likely not going to have time for Q&A, and I did uh, receive a note that Conrad has a train back to New Jersey at 5.30. So um, we are going to let uh, Lori conclude and then take um, questions for the speakers during the reception, and then any that need to be passed on to Conrad, please give to me. But thank you for joining us. And Lori, it is all you. Okay, thanks. Well, this seems unfair. I'm, going to, I'm just going to fly through so that there might be some time for questions and we can get outside and uh, before Conrad leaves, et cetera. And it's also a, a really unfair to have to follow Carolyn Maloney. <laughs> but if see. anybody could First do it, I'm it's going you. to go put on my red dress. So we have our new acronym, <laughs> OLSP. Yes, a fabulous new acronym. I think it will help us uh, more efficiently identify fistula patients arguably, but definitely it will help better serve the needs of women who have survived obstructed labor by addressing or at least identifying all of the true needs that they actually have. There are also cross-cutting risk factors and impacts of various maternal morbidities so that we can begin to harmonize and invest in economies of scale and scope. For instance, we know that long labor, especially ridiculously uh, unhealthily long labor, is a risk factor for obstetric fistula. We know that. It's also a risk factor, at least in this latest data coming out of Ethiopia, in low and middle income nations for higher degrees and higher rates of pelvic organ prolapse. And if anybody doesn't know what that means, I don't have time to explain it. Now, I'll happily explain it at the break, or you can get on the internet and look it up. Uh, also having many children. We think of fistula patients only as being the young child bride who's having a baby at 14. And while that is part of the demographic, and a very tragic part of the demographic, actually, more, if, you, if you go to a fistula camp, any fistula camp, at least half, if not more than half, will be mature mothers of many children, full-grown women. They've had five, six, 10, 12 babies. I've taken care of a patient who had a fistula with her 21st delivery. The first 20 she had at home. She was a camel herder in Somaliland. She had all her babies, sorry, on the road. No problem. The 21st baby was transverse lie obstructed labor. Okay, so we have that. And there's the data showing that in, in recent Ethiopia uh, survey of women with pelvic organ prolapse, 75% had five or more childbirth histories. We also see cross-cutting impacts on quality of life. There's a recent uh, study out of an outpatient clinic from one of our most renowned fistula surgeons, Dr. Mulu Muleta. In her clinic, there's about a 10 to 1 prolapse to fistula ratio. So this is approximately 350 prolapse pa severe prolapse patients and 37 fistula patients. And they applied the Beck Depression Inventory, which is a well-established screening tool, quick, quick, for various degrees of depression. And almost, oh sorry, uh, almost all, as you can imagine, of the fistula patients were severely depressed, but so were two-thirds of the severe, severe prolapse patients. Again, impact on quality of life. We're seeing all these ways that we can come together as they request from Ethiopia for a holistic approach to uh, women with severe pelvic floor disorders, and that includes fistula, it includes prolapse, it includes incontinence, it includes congenital anomalies et cetera, et cetera, and not all of these uh, therapies are surgical, I'm sorry to say, as a surgeon, but <laughs> so we have ways that we can invest in midwifery training to address some of these issues as well. And if we believe in it or not in the international reproductive health community, it's happening from a grassroots level. This, I'm sorry for that, but it was so enthusiastically handed to me, I said, I promise you I'm going to show this every time I can. This is a brochure that my, my fistula surgeon colleague, Dr. Seba Akhtar, handed to me at the South uh, Asian OBGYN meeting of just a couple of months ago. She's so proud. She, of, on her own, pulled fistula into a broader spectrum of care. And I'm sorry, it's 
somebody told me this slide wasn't going to work, and they were right. It's in there with prolapse and various forms of incontinence and congenital anomalies and other injuries as well. So fistula is being pulled into a broader spectrum of care, which makes sense. It's also happening at a remarkable level in Ghana, the senior fistula surgeons who are well known to all of us in the fistula community of practice, took it upon themselves a few years ago to launch Africa's first fully academically accredited urogynecology fellowship. Urogynecology in the United States is prolapse incontinence and some other stuff on the side, chronic pelvic pain. In Africa, it's fistula prolapse and incontinence. So now they have this fully accredited, full-on academic program for fellows, and they have engaged International Urogyneco Urogynecologic Association for academic backstop and in-country uh, training. And we have here with us today Chuck Shields. Chuck, raise your hand. Uh, who is the executive director of International Urogyne Association, if anyone has any questions later. But you see these amazing intrinsic programs happening already. Let's be a part of it. Let's be a part of it because it's happening. Let's make sure that the training that's happening there is to the same standard to the fistula training that we've been working so hard to keep up to the best possible standard and also to advocate and always be present and hypervigilant that the fistula patients in these integrated programs somehow don't drop down in the priority list. They stay up at the top of the priority list. We have to engage. We have to be present. These things are ongoing. Let's be a part of it. And we have that in Fistula Care Plus. It had a preceding project called Fistula Care, which was solely devoted to identifying, treating, and reintegrating women with fistula. That's it. But with Fistula Care Plus, which started in 2013, uh, per our USAID mandate, we have a, an arm to look at prevention of fistula. And I think for us, for our small group, the maternal health community needs to work with partograms and conditions of working on, on eradicating end-stage obstructive labor. But for us, it's about iatrogenic fistula. Big, 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 very scary dynamic going on for the prevention side. And then also to integrate prolapse into our systems, not because someone thought it was a good idea, because the women come to the clinics and it's horrifying to turn them away. They're really suffering, and for the, particularly for those who don't have the money, um, and some prolapse patients are very wealthy, by the way, but for those who don't in poor countries, it can be uh, on a scale of in the equal neighborhood of quality of life impact as fistula. We also see our colleagues at UNFPA who have been very active with prolapse in Nepal for some years now, bringing it into Sub-Saharan Africa through their active programs, recent programs, uh, just a couple of months ago, I think, right, Aaron, In Ethiopia. And so we can also begin to consider, um, do we, there may be some settings where silo model care delivery is simply smarter, but probably integrated multiple service delivery is going to be smarter. But, so we can begin to discuss that at the level as international uh, participants in this process, uh, there may be, again, we ha we're familiar with silo model funding and service delivery, and it might work better in certain circumstances. Let's figure out what those criteria are, but understand that an integrated model is happening from the grassroots up. Whether we do it or not, it's going to happen. Okay. I'm very glad Carolyn's out of the room, and I hope I don't make anybody upset, but we have to also look at the Millennium Development Goal menu of beliefs, I call it, regarding Again, through the lens of preventing obstetric fistula, there, there is a, a narrative that was developed, and it's held forth by every stakeholder organization represented in this room today, that we, the, uh, these are social determinants that we hold very near and dear, that we state are mandatory to eradicate fistula, and let's just take a quick look so we can go have some wine and look at blankets. Um, forced marriage, young child, young marriage, and young childbirth that somehow we need to push first baby post 18 years of age and make sure she's educated in the process and empower her in many, many different ways. Also empower women at large through family planning, always a good idea. It, it reduces all obstetric risk, risk issues um, because it minimizes the number of times you're pregnant in a lifetime. And, and antenatal care, not intrapartum care, antenatal care is mandatory to eradicate fistula. Emancipation is mandatory to eradicate fistula, and oh, by the way, let's get rid of gender-based violence and things that are scary, like female genital circumcision, mandatory to eradicate fistula. This is what you will read in the mission statements of many organizations. And then finally, um, emergency obstetric and neonatal care. Now that's the core of it, really. That's the real core. 
We know that we have eradicated fistula, obstetric fistula, in high-income countries. It happened at the turn of the 20th century. It happened on or around 1900, 1920, something. How do we know this? Well, the fistula hospital was opened in 1878, I think, and it was closed in around 1928, and it was torn down because it was no longer necessary. So right in that period, fistula was eradicated in high-income countries. And let's think about all of these allegedly mandatory determinants that we hold true today and see what was going on historically at that time for women at the time that fistula was eradicated. Now this is a pre-antibiotic era. Few people had phones, few people had electricity, few people had cars. There was no such thing as an aeroplane. Okay? All right. There was no UNICEF. There was some public health, but there was certainly no childhood nutrition program. So we weren't thinking about making sure that pelvis were big enough for babies to just fall out with no problem and getting girls to uh, bone age maturity between 15 and 17 before they have a baby. Life expectancy was well under 50. Illiteracy and minimal literacy was common. Child labor was normal. We are living in the vestiges of it. Why do we have summer vacation? Because kids had to work on the farm. They couldn't go to school. That's why we have summer vacation, not to feed the tourist industry. Um, marriage occurred shortly after menarche, and of course, you immediately began having babies, and you had as many babies as you could because the only birth control was lactation and avoiding your husband. And there was no such thing as antenatal care. There was no notion of gender-based violence as a human rights issue for women, and women further didn't have rights to much of anything at all, including the right to vote or hold office. And yet, in that environment, I'm, I'm just putting it out there. Fistula was eradicated. Why? I really don't know. I'm not a medical anthropologist, but if I had to guess, it was probably the fact that it was the advent around that time, general anesthesia in its very earliest forms was developed. We're talking chloroform and ether on a cloth. And it revolutionized all of surgery. Before that, someone held you down and someone else did whatever cutting you needed done. And not a lot of cesareans were done under those circumstances. But afterwards, it revolutionized everything, including obstetric operative delivery. And possibly that was a catalyst at that time in those cultures. We need to figure out what today's catalyst is. And I truly believe that the key is build it and they will come. Let's have competently trained people who are working under competent conditions. And people will come. Communities will engage. They will. That's the key. That's where we have to focus our efforts. It's nice to cross message with things like everybody marry after 18, but don't forget, we've eradicated fistula here for generations now. And every year in the United States, about 12,000 girls under the age of 15, under the age of 15, give birth to babies. You're never going to eradicate babies having babies. And it's not a, never a good thing. Nobody likes it, but it's not mandatory to eradicate fistula. OK, I said it. <laughs> so to summarize these cross-cutting narratives, uh, prevention is about eradicating obstructed labor. In terms of screening, let's think about obstru obstructed labor screening programs, possibly. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. We have to be hyper-vigilant about this dynamic between reducing obstetric fistula to make sure we don't transform these women into iatrogenic fistula. It's already occurring, and it's really a bit of a nightmare. Uh, and then the academic transformations are magical. That's the real sustainability. We can't do the academic transformations. Those are intrinsic to the societies, but we can certainly show up and support, and we can advocate, and we, we can use our bully pulpits. And again, do we want girls who just have a big pelvis, who get to the age of 18 and they're married? I mean, that's like saying our goal is that she should happily be able to have a baby under a tree. This is not the goal. The goal is that every woman, every time, has access to a facility that is outfitted and staffed to meet a minimum standard of care, within which both the health outcomes of the baby and the mother are optimized, and that that care is rendered in a humane, kind, and caring fashion. Thank you. So, Mary Ellen, she did it again, didn't she? I saw you nodding away. Um, I always ask you all to join me in thanking the speakers, which of course I, I am, but especially Lori for starting up and stopping three times. No, no. no. <laughs>
Um, thank you. I do hope you join us for the reception. I'm, I apologize that we don't have time for a formal discussion in the room t today, but hopefully you all can, can stay on for a bit longer and take questions there. But um, thank you for staying extra. Um, really appreciate it. And continue to come to our events and follow our work on Facebook, Twitter, our blog, our website. And again, thank, thank our speakers alongside with me. Sometimes they'll edit the video itself, and so to just like.